Today I'm so excited because I will share with you how to make a kitchen kosher for all year long or for Passover using this non-kosher kitchen and transforming it into a kosher kitchen. I will explain what a kosher kitchen means, the five specific cleaning techniques we use to make the oven, the fridge, the sink, the cupboards and counter kosher as Orthodox Sephardic Jews, making sure to show you in details where food gets trapped, what we do to remove it, and I think you will be surprised by what and where we will find food residue in this non-kosher kitchen. And if you're new here, hi, my name is Sarah Monka, and on my channel, I share all facets of my Orthodox Sephardic Jewish life as a full-time working mom. And if you are a returning friend, thank you so much for being here. It means the world to me. So whether you are here to simply spend some time with me, or whether you just need a cleaning partner for some motivation and you put me in the background while you are doing your own cleaning, I'm so grateful you are here and we are spending some time together. Please don't forget to leave this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Let me put on a pretty techol and let's jump into it. This kitchen was part of a rental unit where non-kosher food was used, making it non-kosher, hence nothing can be used as is for us as Orthodox Jews, even if at first glance, yes, this kitchen is dirty, but seems overall okay. Our main goal will be to purge any and all traces of non-kosher food from the kitchen appliances, sink and surfaces before they can be used in a kosher kitchen. On a side note, we would do the same kind of cleaning if you would be cleaning a kosher kitchen to remove all traces of leaven products in preparation for Passover, so you could compare it to a super deep spring cleaning. My first step is to remove all surface traces of non-kosher food, so I need to clean the kitchen thoroughly with strong cleaners. I will start by the cupboards and I always clean from top to bottom. While I'm cleaning, let me explain to you what makes a kitchen kosher for us as Orthodox Sephardic Jews. A kosher kitchen is a kitchen in which food is prepared according to the Jewish kosher dietary laws. Here are some basic rules we use to ensure that a kosher kitchen remains kosher and that all the food produced therein is also kosher. All processed food we use, without exception, is certified kosher. Meat and dairy are kept strictly separated. When preparing for a meat meal, generally it will be prepared with meat pots and utensils and served on meat dishes. And we would do the same when preparing for a dairy meal. Therefore, we have at least two sets of dishes, one for meat and one for milk in our kosher kitchen. We use separate sinks for meat and milk, and if we do not have two sinks in a kitchen, like I did when I was in medical school, usually the main kitchen sink will be used for meat, and the washroom sink will be used for milk, or vice versa. Our oven and dishwashers are designated for exclusive use with meat or dairy, and may not be used for both, even if not being used at the same time. Beside following the general laws to keeping a kosher kitchen, one of the most important rules we teach our children and share with our guests and family is when in doubt, say something. Do you think you used the wrong dish by mistake? Please let us know. Wondering if a utensil is meat or dairy? Please ask us. This simple rule allowed us to avoid many, many mistakes. During our cleaning, we did not only find tons of dust and dirt in the cupboards, we also found funny items left behind by the previous tenants, including non-kosher candies, Tupperwares, and a cute Lego. 
because the inside of the cupboards, the pantry, and drawers are made of natural porous wood with natural grooves where non-kosher elements might have been absorbed by the wood and we cannot remove them even with a thorough cleaning, we do not want to take any chance if food fall on these surfaces which would bring us to doubt if their status is still kosher or not. So to avoid such situation, I will cover the inside of the cupboards and drawers with a plastic cover. For the pantry, I will cover each plank of wood with a washable contact paper. This extra step to cover the cupboards, drawers and pantry will not only make it so much easier to clean everything, but it will also give us peace of mind that if anything falls on the new plastic or contact paper, it will remain kosher and you will not have any doubts about its status. Once the cupboards and pantry are clean, I turn my attention to the oven. This is definitely one of the appliances I will spend the most time on because it is really tricky to make it kosher. My first step is to move the oven back to see what is hiding under it and what we found did not disappoint. I guess the previous tenants had a dog which would explain the amount of dog food everywhere. I remove the vent protectors and I will clean them a bit later with the oven racks. The sides of the counters and the backsplash are quite dirty, so I will start by cleaning them first. A bit of elbow grease and a good soap, here I'm using some Dawn Power Wash, does the trick to remove everything. Once I'm done, I will clean the side of the stove. As you can see, there's a lot of hidden food residue everywhere. I do a first pass with the vacuum, then soak everything with my special Dawn Power Wash. I try to remove as much as I can with my normal sponge. I finish by doing some detailed work, making sure to remove all the food from the nooks and crannies from the side of the stovetop. And of course, I will repeat the same operation on the second side. I move to the floor and I cannot tell you how satisfying it is to remove all this gunk. Once everything is cleaned and after a good workout trying to push back the oven in its place, I can clean the oven itself. I prepare a bucket of warm soapy water where I will put all the knobs of the stovetop as often there is a lot of food residue stuck on them. I simply let them soak in the warm water to soften all the gunk. While the knobs are soaking in their wonderful jacuzzi, I clean the control panel making sure to go everywhere where we could find food in this odd place. Then I move to the stove top. Beside the dust, there's a lot of burned food residue that seems to have accumulated over a long period of time, so I will have to use different methods to remove the caked on residue. While I try to remove it thoroughly, let me explain to you a very important law in a kosher kitchen. The basic principle to bear in mind when making an appliance kosher, which is called kosherizing, is that the way the non-kosher food substance, or for Passover the chametz or leaven product, is absorbed into the surfaces of the appliance, the same method should be used to expel it. For a stovetop where non-kosher food were used, or in a kosher kitchen where leaven products fell on the stovetop burners and were absorbed, so to speak, into the surface of the burners, to make them kosher again, they have to be heated to remove the residues. Therefore, once the stovetop will be completely cleansed of all residues, I will let it purge for 24 hours. And after that time, I turn the burners of the stovetop to high so they come to a glow and leave them burn for 30 minutes. I will usually do them two at a time to avoid making the kitchen too hot. After that time, the burners are considered kosher and can be used whether for Passover, when we prepare for Passover, or now are kosher to be used in our kosher kitchen. 
Next up, the oven itself. Again, I always clean from top to bottom, so I start by cleaning the handle thoroughly, and then I move to the window. Once they are both thoroughly cleaned, I remove everything from the oven. Then I remove the racks of the oven, and I bring them with the vent protector in the bathroom to clean them. I spray them with the oven spray and within a few minutes it loosens up all the gunk from the oven racks and with a fine steel wool pad I can remove everything else. And as you can see, boy oh boy, they were so dirty. With a bit of elbow grease and a bit of patience, finally they are all clean. I will rinse them and let them air dry and while they are drying, I will move on to the inside of the oven itself. Because the inside of the oven is not that dirty, I simply use a wet fine steel wool and everything goes away with ease. But if the food was more caked on, I would use the oven cleaner to make my life easier. I clean the inside part of the glass oven door using Dawn Power Wash to lift the grease up and the fine steel wool to remove everything. And really this combination cleans the door like magic. I wipe everything down. I place back the racks in the oven. Then I move down to the warming drawer. I start by removing all the things left over from the previous tenants. None of the baking items could be used by us as they were most probably used with non-kosher food, hence making them not kosher, but rest assured they will be given away after a good clean. I clean the bottom drawer, taking my time to remove all the dirt and food residue in all the nooks and crannies, especially in the tight spaces like here, where you can see there is more gunk and food stuck down there that I could have imagined. Like the stove top, I will let the oven rest for 24 hours after I clean the inside, and after that period, I will do an auto clean or self clean to make the oven kosher. I'm using the same principle as the stovetop because non-kosher items or leaven products when it is Passover were absorbed through heat in the surfaces of the oven, therefore we have to use heat to remove them. Once the auto clean cycle is done, the oven is completely kosher for all year long and for Passover. Now I can turn my attention to the fridge. Since I always clean from top to bottom, I will start with the top of the fridge, which definitely needed it. Once it's fully cleaned, then I clean the rubber seals, and if you did not clean yours in a while, here is your friendly reminder not to forget to clean them, because wow, these really needed a good clean. I can finally turn to the inside of the fridge. At first glance, it does not look so bad, but often looks can be deceiving. I start by removing all the shelves and drawers from the fridge and I put them aside. What I find inside after removing everything does not disappoint. This fridge is full of surprises. I do a first general clean of the walls and the door of the fridge with some Dawn Power Wash to remove the brunt of the dirt. Because so far this fridge looks like a gift that keeps on giving, I suspect the more I will look, the more I will find surprises. Therefore, I will not take a chance and I will remove the shelves brackets on both sides. And again, I'm not disappointed with what I find. At this point, I will not even guess what is that residue, but if you know what it is, please let me know in the comments below. The bottom of the fridge is quite a sight for sore eyes if you like to deep clean. I start cleaning with a toothbrush to go in all the nooks and crannies of the fridge. And I do not know about you, but this type of cleaning is so satisfying to me. 
Because I found so many surprises on the side brackets, I removed the bottom drawer bracket as well. And again, it is so satisfying to find all this gunk trapped everywhere. I really feel like this hard work is paying off. Once the door and inside walls are nice and clean, I turn my attention to the bottom of the fridge door and this fridge really keeps on giving. Once the inside part of the lower door is clean, I'm going to clean now the outside part of the lower door. And again, it's a gift that keeps on giving. I move to the freezer. And once again, I cleaned the rubber seals, and if you thought the top of the fridge needed a good clean, so does the bottom seal. For the inside of the freezer, I repeat the same steps I took for the inside of the fridge. I remove everything that I can find inside, including the baskets. I clean every corners of this freezer, including the baskets where I find quite a bit of gunk. After cleaning them and before I leave them to air dry, I put a towel on the counter as the counters are still not kosher. I clean the shelves and the drawers of the fridge and you would be surprised how much food residue we can find in all the corners of the shelves, the drawers and anything in between. I clean the bottom of the freezer and I'm still surprised by what I find. Once everything is clean and dry, I place them back. And on a side note, our Ashkenazi brothers would often add shelves liners for Passover, but as Sephardic Jews, it is not our custom. Finally, I clean behind and under the refrigerator. And once again, I'm so happy to find these little surprises like this one. Now that this refrigerator and freezer are all clean from top to bottom and everything is back in place, they are officially kosher to use for all year long or for Passover. Fridge freezer combo done, now the counters and sink. When I clean the backsplash and counters, I pay close attention to the corners. I also pay special attention around the sink, taking a toothbrush to remove all the gunk and every time I am surprised how much dirt I can find in this area. For the sink, I clean the faucet first. As you can see, there are food residues on the aerator and in its groove. To make sure I clean everything, I will remove the aerator and inside we have some lovely gems. I clean the spout thoroughly and I replace the aerator and I put it back in place. I clean the faucets paying special attention to under the handles which again are full of surprises. For the rest of the sink, I remove any residue with some Dawn Power Wash, some of the pink stuff, and a fine steel wool. For the drain, I clean it with a toothbrush to really reach inside all crevices. Once the counters and sink are clean, I will let them sit for 24 hours and after that time I will do the kosherizing process called the irui or pouring of boiling water on surfaces that cannot be heated like the oven or stovetop. I pour the boiling water from back to front, letting it drip on the sides. I do the same thing for the sink, starting from the top, then the handles, the edges of the sink, and finally the sink itself. In total, to make sure that every part of the sink will be touched by boiling water, it will take me about three to four kettles to do it completely. Right after pouring the boiling water, I pour cold water on the surfaces. 
Because the counters are older and porous, I will cover them with a thick plastic sheet. Many of our Ashkenazi and Hasidic brothers would use aluminum foil to cover the entirety of their kitchen to make sure that all surfaces are kosher, especially for Passover, making their kitchen look like the inside of a space shuttle, which is a look I absolutely love. After cleaning all the nooks and crannies of this kitchen, kosherizing the appliances, counter sinks, and covering the counters, this non-kosher kitchen is now kosher and can be used all year long or for Passover. The only thing left is to designate specific cupboards to store pots, pans, utensils, and dishes, as well as a specific sink and counter space to prepare milk meals, and to do the same things for a meat side, because as you know, as Orthodox Jews, we never mix meat and milk, even in the preparation phase. I made a video with a complete tour of our Orthodox Sephardic culture kitchen, explaining why we have five sets of dishes, how we organize everything separated for meat and milk. I hope you will enjoy that video next, and I will leave for you the link above and in the description box below for that video. I would love to know, what was the thing that surprised you the most regarding how to make a kitchen kosher? Let me know in the comments below. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It means the world to me. And know that your presence is like a miracle in my life and I would not be here without you. And if you're here until the end, please write in the comments. I love a clean kitchen, so I know I was not alone. And if nobody told you today, know that you are loved and you are enough just the way you are. Until next time, stay safe, stay blessed, and don't forget to from it up. Or lay lazy in bed with your head on my chest. I hope you don't mind. If I say that I love you